Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome, and if you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. We continue the series that was chosen for this summer by our Patreon supporters, of Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Now, I do want to say that this week's episode of Mr. and Mrs. Blandings was provided by Radio Archives. This week's show and next week's come off of their uh, Treasures Volume 10, which collects a whole bunch of episodes from different series. Of course, Radio Archives sells high-quality old-time radio collections, pulp fiction ebook reprints, as well as high-quality pulp fiction audiobooks, and they'd like to give you a sample of one of each of these products. You can obtain those by sending an email to detectives at radioarchives.com. They also are making the recordings of all 36,000 transcription discs that they have acquired over the years available to subscribers at a rate of 600 transfers per month. These are high-quality programs, some of which are not in common circulation. I've already listened to some episodes of programs I like, such as Heartbeat Theater, Hour of Charm, or Miss Brooks, and Burns and Allen that I haven't been able to find anywhere else, as well as some lesser-known programs. You can sample the first month of these transfers for $59.98, which benefits the great detectives of old-time radio and the amazing world of radio. And if you like what you hear, you can get a full subscription for $60 per month and receive 600 transfers every month for $60, which is half off the normal price. So check those out at transfers.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. The original air date is April the 29th, 1951, and the title of is Hiking with the Youth Group. Flying's the way to travel, and the way to fly is TWA, Trans World Airlines. <laughs> Presenting Cary Grant and Betsy Drake as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings in a new series based on Eric Hodgins' best-selling novels Mr. Blandings Builds His Dream House and Blandings Way. Did you know that approximately every three minutes around the clock, a TWA Skyliner is making a landing at one of the airports along its 32,000-mile route? You love to fly high up in the sky You ride the airways, starry stairways Smoother and swifter, flying the way And the best way to fly, T-W-A Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake As you know, Jim and Muriel Blandings always tried to be good parents to their two children, Susan and Joan. They've read books on child care, and they've attended lectures on child care. And from their wealth of experience, they have learned one thing, which, as Jim Blandings puts it, is... Child psychology is the answer. Child psychology is proven. Child psychology is tested. Our children always use child psychology. And we're the best trained parents in town. <laughs> Muriel is well-trained, too. And so it was with quiet competence that she met the situation last night when her nine-year-old daughter, Susan, appeared and said, I won't be home for dinner tonight, Mother. No? Why not, dear? I'm going to run away and get married. (laughs) Susan, you can't do that. This is a school night. (laughs) Now, Now go wash your face. Mother, look at this article. 
Let's see. Uh, the girls of today should prepare to become the mothers of tomorrow. Well, that's true, isn't it? Yes. As a matter of fact, if they don't, I wouldn't know who to tell to get ready. <laughs> but still, I say you're too young. What's that noise outside? Oh, that must be Johnny now. Hi, Johnny. Hi, Susan. You still want our loaf? <laughs> Why not? This ladder is awful heavy. Oh, well, I'm not sure it's proper, but I'll come down and help you. Just a minute, Susan. Johnny. Hi, Miss Blandings. Johnny, you stay right there. I'm coming down and have a talk with you. Uh-oh. And you stay right here, young lady. I'll talk with you later. Hello, darling. Jim, I didn't know you were home yet. Just walked in the door. Well, you better walk right back out again. You have a fatherly duty to perform. Oh? Johnny Miller is waiting outside to elope with Susan. Johnny Miller and Susan? Muriel, have you been nipping at the raspberry cordial? <laughs> Jim, this is serious. Look out that side window. All right. Great Scott! He's putting up a ladder. You see, he could slip and come smashing to the ground. With my good ladder? <laughs> yes, and carrying one of your best daughters. Mm. I'll bring him in for a talk right away. <laughs> ah, Johnny, it seems like a good time for a man-to-man -man talk. Man-to-man? -man? Gee, thanks. Don't mention it. And try to keep your voice from changing. <laughs> now, uh, sit right here, my boy. Yes, sir. Cigar? Not right now, thank you. A drink, perhaps. Anything you say. Coke is my drink. Mm. Mixer? Straight. Good boy. <laughs> you know, two fingers of Coke. Neat. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, you want to marry my daughter, eh? Well, I guess so, sir. You guess so? It's something to do. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. So you decided to take Susan for your wife, eh? Yes, sir. It was either her or Agnes, and Agnes wears bands. How's that? A fellow wouldn't want a girl who has her teeth wired in. Of course not. Of course not. She might rust. <laughs> now, look, Johnny, don't you think Susan might be a little young for marriage? She's only nine. That's the right time. Get them while they're like putty in your hands. Because <laughs> I remember I had somewhat the same idea. Because my wife was 20 when I married her. That's okay for you. Personally, I wouldn't take a chance on an old maid. I was in no position to shop around. Johnny, I hate to intrude with mundane matters, but wives have a nasty habit. They expect husbands to provide them with little luxuries like shoes. Oh, Susan has shoes. I've noticed. You're very observing. Now, supposing you're married to her. Those shoes wear out. She's got to have new ones. Then what do you do? We just have a fight about it. I see. <laughs> then she goes home to her mother and dad. Yeah? While she's there, she has them buy her new pair of shoes. <laughs> well, you've got the situation pretty well figured out, haven't you? Sure. I know these things. I listen to the radio. That's how John does it to his other wife. <laughs> now, Johnny, I'm afraid we can't permit Susan to be your other wife. No? No, I'm sorry, but I think it best that you wait until you're both a little older. I want you to finish grammar school and high school and college. And finally, when you have a fine job with the future, come back and we'll have another talk. Will you give me another Coke? I'll put one in the icebox now so it'll be cold. <laughs> okay, it's a deal. Shake. Shake. <laughs> I hope the steak is all right. It's fine, Maud. Well, eat slow. At the price the butcher charged for that steak, you can't afford to swallow fast. <laughs> price control. <laughs> you, you, you know, something's got to be done about Susan. No, Jim, Susan's just going through a phase. Think back. Didn't you have any young loves? What, at the age of nine? Well, hardly. No interest in the opposite sex? Well, at that stage, the only thing I knew about sex was that it came after five. <laughs> oh, <Jimmy. laughs> well, of course, 
I, I, uh, I admit, I, uh, I did follow one girl home from school. But that was only to see the billy goat she had in the backyard. And to think I was flattered when you courted me. Yes, yes. Well, eat your dinner and don't worry about Johnny and Susan. It's not serious. Not serious? Muriel, imagine what the neighbors would think of us if those two had run off. What kind of parents would have a nine-year-old daughter running off to get married? Move over, Lem. You're standing on Grandpa. Muriel. <laughs> no, by heck, it's Grandma. Hard to tell. They're both wearing the same color flower sacks. <laughs> Say, uh, were you calling me, Mrs. Blandings? Yup, Amy Lou. Bring in the corn squeezins and a char tobacco. <laughs> what? Oh, that is Mrs. Blanding's bucolic way of suggesting that you may serve the coffee and cigarettes. Uh, yes, Mr. Blandings. Oh, Maud, have you looked in at Susan? Oh, yes. Um, she's lying there in bed with the sweetest, most innocent smile on her face. Fell sound asleep listening to that radio program, Gruesome Murder Tales. <laughs> I'll get the coffee. That's it, Muriel. That's what, dear? Well, that's the trouble with Susan and all her friends. All the kids know today they learn from soap operas and jazz records and television. Well, you might say that their brain food is all canned. <laughs> There's some truth to that. Of course, they go to school. Well, school's fine, but, but it was after school that we lived. Games, hiking, camping. Muriel, let's get Susan started in the Girl Scouts tomorrow. Well, Jim, there aren't any Girl Scout groups in Lansdale. All right, then the campfire girls. No campfire girls, no bluebirds, not even any Boy Scouts. If you want a good deed done, you have to send to New Haven. <laughs> well, that's going to be changed. I've got a good mind to bring it up before the civic committee meeting tonight. What? And interrupt their poker game? Before it starts. I'll get up before them and I'll say, Gentlemen, the trouble with our modern children is that their knowledge of the world is gained from soap operas and jazz records and television. They're... Their, uh, what was that phrase I used? I thought it was rather clever at the time. What was that? Oh, yes, oh, yes. The one that goes, um, their brain food is all canned. Shall I write it down? Oh, no need for that. I'll think of something to say on the spur of the moment. <laughs> of the Lansdale Civic Committee is now in session. Charlie Smoot will read the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, uh, meeting was called to order at 8-5. Mayor Cronk presided and Fire Chief Gibbons banked the poker game. Business discussed was the purchase of a new flagpole for the school, a cash settlement of the Witty Hickey's claim, and the motion was passed to send flour to the late Edgar Yates, city exterminator who exterminated himself. <laughs> The meeting broke up promptly at 10.30 when the ace of spades fell out of Constable Arquette's sleeve. <laughs> I object! So did we. Tonight you're playing your undershirt. Now just uh, blame Myrna. Yeah, 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 yeah. Order, order. Let's, Let's get home. the business over yeah. so yeah. we can get to the poker game. Mr. Mayor, there's a serious matter I'd like to bring up. Have to wait your turn, Mr. Blandings. First of all, we'll have the treasurer's report. Go ahead, treasurer. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> gentlemen... <laughs> Balance in our city treasury is approximately $126.42. Uh, depending. Depending on what? Depending on how I do in a poker game tonight. <laughs> now, great balls of fire. You mean to say you're using city funds to play poker? Uh, I didn't mean to say any such thing. Oh. Just slipped out. <laughs> As long as the treasurer's here, I'd like to bring up an item. The city's got to be getting me a new uniform. Well, what's the matter with the old one? Yeah. What's the matter? Just take a look at the seat of these pants. Say, they are wearing kind of thin. Thin? For me, every little breeze does more than whisper Louise. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Constable. We'll see what we can do. Yeah. Now let's get to the poker game. I beg your pardon, Mayor. There's a matter I'd like to bring up before this meeting. Okay, but you're holding up the game. <sighs> Gentlemen, you are the civic fathers of this community. What are you going to do about children? Keep having them. <laughs> now that's settled, let's get started. I'll stack the chips. Twenty whites, ten reds, five blues. Gentlemen, please. This is a serious problem, a matter of deep concern to each and every one of you. Do you know what we urgently need? Two more blue chips. Right, two more. <laughs> no, no. 
Not two more blue chips. There is a crying need in this community for organized recreation for our children. We don't have a single youth organization, no supervised play, no program for carrying on this all-important work. That's true. All children know today they learn from soap operas, jazz records, and television. Why, you might say... Yeah, you might say all their brain food is canned. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good, eh? Mr. Blandings, I'm sure you were about to make a point. What is it? Just this, Mayor Cronk. I think we in this community should do something for our children. Well, Mr. Blandings, in me, you have an ally. Good. <laughs> then I'm sure you will support my proposition, which is that we appoint someone to institute a youth program to, well, for example, to conduct weekly nature trips. Hikes into the woods, that sort of thing. Mr. Blanding, that's a beautiful thought. Mm. I do yeah. support your proposition. Nay, I go further. I propose that you be that person. Good. <laughs> me? <laughs> hey, you can't do this to me. Anyone second the motion? Second. But you can't do this to me. All in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carried. Congratulations, Mr. Blanding. And cut for the deal. You did it to me. Good work. Cut for the deal. I only get a week's vacation. Where can you go in a week? How should I travel to the West Coast? What'll it cost me to fly to Rome? Where, when, how? You know, friends, you can come up with a thousand and one questions once you start thinking about a vacation. And fortunately for us, there's one place to get all the answers. The right answers. Courteous answers, prompt answers. And that, friends, is at your local travel agent. You see, every skilled, intelligent travel agent is specially trained to help you get more fun out of your vacation trip, whether it's just a weekend quickie vacation in Arizona or a couple of months abroad visiting such historic spots as London, Rome, or fabulous Paris. And your travel agent not only helps make travel more pleasant and rewarding by suggesting the most fascinating sights to see and places to visit, he saves you time and money, too. That's because he knows the shortcuts of travel from long experience. He knows all about special fares, reduced rates, gets reservations quickly, arranges choice accommodations, saves you all the bother and annoyance of handling small details. Now, of course, your travel agent knows all about the many, many advantages of flying TWA, Trans World Airlines, across the United States and overseas. So consult him tomorrow about that contemplated vacation of yours. Just a few words with him can add immeasurably to your comfort and peace of mind. And so today, TWA salutes your neighborhood travel agent and his fellow members throughout the world. A wonderful group of people doing a great job for you. Now the second act of Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake. Well, it's happened again. Jim Blandings has deftly and efficiently put his foot in his mouth. Last night at the Lansdale Civic Committee meeting, Jim suggested, in a loud, clear voice, that somebody should conduct a program of nature trips for the children of the town. The committee quickly agreed that somebody should, and unanimously appointed Jim to the role of somebody. And so now we find Jim, keenly aware of his civic duties and responsibilities, doing what any red-blooded American citizen would do, Trying to figure a way out. <laughs> Let's join him at the breakfast table with Muriel. Yes, I, uh, I could say I broke my arm or my leg. Or maybe I could have the measles. Yeah, I could paint spots on my face. Oh, now, really, Jim? More coffee, Mr. Blandings? Oh, that's an idea, Ma. Drown me in it. <laughs> oh, Mr. Blandings, I saw your name in the paper. You were right between handy hints and the obituaries. <laughs> Tomorrow I may move over. <laughs> Told all about how you was going to take all the kids on a big hike Jim, I don't see... Oh, the phone, I'll get it I don't see how you can get out of it, dear It's printed no. in the paper I'll simply call the mayor and tell him I'm out of town on a business trip But it's your idea, you can't walk out I'll take a plane uh, Mr. Blandings, hmm? it's a Mrs. Libby on the phone She uh, wants to know if her son Stanley can go on the hike There isn't going to be any hike Tell her, uh... 
Tell her I broke my toe. You broke her toe? On his way to the plane while painting on spots for his measles. Oh, that's not funny. Oh, Daddy. Daddy, it's so wonderful about you taking us on the hike. Oh, now, Susan, the hike isn't so much. Oh, but it is. All the kids are talking about it. They all wish they had a wonderful daddy like you. Hmm. They do? Well. <laughs> Golly, there isn't another daddy in town who even thinks of such good things. Well, I, <clears throat> I, uh, I don't know what to say. Uh, what do you think, Muriel? I think a plane load of measles just came in for a landing. Well, after all, I did agree to go. Of course, dear, and don't worry. I'll be at home preparing a hot mustard bath for your feet. Oh, but you can't be home, Mother. I can't? Oh, no, I told Janie's mother you were coming to look after the girls. Oh. Care to borrow a slightly used measle? <laughs> For it's high, high, high on the field artillery. Call off your numbers, let us go. One, two, three, four. Where we go, you will always know that the caissons go rolling along. Hey! <laughs> Everybody halt. We rest here. Say, that certainly is a fine marching song. It's corny. Uh, it's what? <laughs> Cornball, strictly for the X. Hmm. And what would a non-ick like yourself suggest? Something hot like Wham, bam, alakazam, orange-colored sky Oh, for heaven's sake Oh, isn't Johnny wonderful? Oh, he's real gone Not far enough <laughs> I'm hungry Here's a sandwich, Janie Well, now, if you will gather around me We will have a class in knot tying Now, would you hand me that rope, Muriel? Here you are. Thank you. Now, now, pay attention, boys and girls. I'm going to show you the clove hitch. Hmm. A very useful knot, isn't it, Muriel? Oh, yes, I've used it I don't know how many times. <laughs> when hitching cloves. Uh, <laughs> all right. On with the lesson. Now, now, first you take the rope. Bend one end around an object. For instance, my wrist in this fashion. Then you pass the first end through the loop like this and take the other end under and under. Over the first end, like this, and then... Uh, yes, dear? Well, then if someone will kindly untangle me, we'll be on our way. <laughs> Daddy, what kind of a tree is that one? Hold it, everyone. Ah, that tree, Susan? Oh, yes, Daddy. Why, that, Susan, happens to be a, uh, a, uh, spruce. A spruce? Hmm. Well, it doesn't look like the one in our yard. Oh, well, this is a very unusual species of spruce. Yes, it has maple leaves on it. <laughs> oh, that's the tree you meant. Quiet, quiet. Quiet, everyone. Listen to that bird. Now, who can identify that bird call? I think it's a robin. I think it's a thrush. I think I'm hungry. <laughs> Here's a banana, Janie. Mm, fine students of nature. That was obviously the call of the Baltimore Oriole. <laughs> hey, Susan, look at me. I'm turned. Ah, ah! <laughs> Sounds more like Tarzan's mother. <laughs> Get him down from there. Stanley, come down from there. Ah! Uh, oh, Stan, I said come down. Now, if you do, I'll show you how to make a fire by rubbing two sticks together. Do what? I'll make a fire by rubbing two sticks together. Oh, brother, this I gotta see. A real fire, Mr. Blandings? A really real fire? The really realest fire you ever saw. Oh, boy, then we can cook something on it. I'm hungry. Here's a candy bar, Janie. Okay, here I am. Let's see you do your stuff. Very well. <clears throat> now, I uh, simply take two sticks like this, and then I rub them together like this. Uh, well, naturally, it doesn't work the first time. Match. 
So I rubbed them even harder the second time, like this. Uh-huh. Then I rubbed them again, like this. Oh. Well, now the sticks are warm, we light them with a match. <laughs> Uh, come on, everybody, on with the march. Jim, I think we really should be getting back. It's almost night time, you know. Hmm? Well, why, so it is. I hope we can find our way. Me too. I'm hungry. <laughs> Here's an orange, Janie. Well, now, don't you worry your little heads about that. When you're with old Daniel Blandings, there's absolutely no problem. You see, I used an old scouting trick. What's that, Jim? Well, I, I don't know if you noticed it or not, Muriel, but I've been dropping bits of paper along the way. All we do to get back is follow them. Clever, huh? Yes, but I haven't noticed any bits of paper. He probably means these. Stanley! <laughs> But great Scott, Stanley, do you realize what this means? This means that we're... that we're... Is lost the word you're groping for? Yeah. Come on. Hey, stop! 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 I can't go on! Stanley, what's the matter? I got something in my shoe! What is it? My foot! <laughs> hey, look behind you. You may find my hand. Now, come on. Jim, are you sure we shouldn't just stop and wait for help or something? Of course not. We're making headway. Look, I swear there's something familiar about that tree. Yes, it's got leaves on it. <laughs> oh, it's the spruce tree with the maple leaves. Jim, it is. Good heavens, we must be going around in a circle. Now, don't get panicky. I'm scared. Me too. But there's nothing to be frightened of. Now, look at me. I'm not worried. It isn't as though there were wild beasts lurking in the trees and bushes out there. <gasps> what was that? <laughs> Stanley, I stepped on his toe. Oh. Johnny, if you don't... don't... Listen. Run for the trees. That is an animal. No, Jim, listen. <laughs> Voices. Huh? Oh, yes. Thank heavens, I think they're Americans. <laughs> hey, fellas, over here. It's Constable Arquette with the search party. Well, howdy, folks. Hello, oh, there. Oh, oh, oh. Constable, am I glad to see you. Why, you're here with a search party almost before we got lost. Mr. Blandings, the Red Cross don't wait till the dams bust before they get ready. <laughs> Yeah, the night you said you was leading this hike, I started wrinkling up my nose like a bloodhound. But how in the world were you able to find this way out here? Just followed the trail. What trail? Sandwich papers, banana peels, candy wrappers, orange peels. Janie, your stomach saved us. Janie, do you hear? I'm hungry. <laughs> Gary Grant and Betsy Drake will be back with us in just a moment. Friends, did you know that TWA is the only airline that goes all the way across the U.S. and overseas to Europe, the Middle East, and India? Yes, you can board a TWA plane in 60 cities in the United States and fly to London, Paris, Rome, and other world centers abroad. And say, just ask anyone who travels a lot, and you'll find out that this one airline service is mighty important. It means you buy only one ticket. You enjoy the same courteous service all the way, and you don't have to worry about complicated connections. So fly the finest. Fly TWA, Trans World Airlines. Next time you plan a trip for business or pleasure, see your friendly travel agent or call your nearest TWA office. You love to fly. You ride the airways, starry stairways Smoother and swifter, flying's the way And the best way to fly, T-W-A
Here again are Cary Grant and Betsy Drake. Jim, now that we're home and the children are up in bed asleep, I want you to promise me that you'll never take them on another hike. Don't worry. I feel as if I've walked a million miles. I'm dead. The next time I take the kids on a trip, it's going to be aboard a TWA Constellation. That's the only way to travel. Sounds good to me. And you know, children under 12 travel at half fare on TWA. <laughs> and babies under two go for nothing. And besides that, the pilot always knows where they're going. You talk me into it. Where will we go? I know a good place. Where? To bed. My feet are killing me. <laughs> good night, dear. Good night, everybody. <laughs> next week, same time, same station, for Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake, brought to you by Transworld Airlines. Across the U.S. and overseas, you can depend on TWA. <laughs> Betsy Drake appears to the courtesy of RKO Pictures and David O. Selznick. Watch for the next Selznick release, Gypsy Blood, starring Jennifer Jones and produced in Technicolor. Constable Arquette was played by Cliff Arquette. Elvia Allman was Maud. Also in our cast were Patty King, Earl Ross, Ken Christie, Ralph Moody, Sammy Ogg, Stuffy Singer, and Norma Jean Nielsen. Tonight's show is written by Charles Stewart and Mort Lockman, directed by Warren Lewis, and transcribed in Hollywood. Don Stanley speaking. Here's a special announcement. Next Saturday afternoon, listen to Alias Jane Doe on another network when the entire broadcast will feature the interesting story of a TWA hostess. Welcome back. Well, this was an interesting episode for a number of reasons. First of all, it's it's fascinating to hear the concerns about the youth and concern that their values and view of the world are being formed by media that is out of touch with reality and the way the world works. So this is not necessarily a new concern that we deal with in our age. I know some folks will listen to something like that and say, well, the older generation always says that. And I can see that as an argument, but I can also see as an argument, well, maybe the older generations have a little bit of a point, even if sometimes it's exaggerated. I did like that they reused the town government setting, but made it different enough so that it didn't become stale. There was one sitcom over radio that found a kind of funny gag in a club meeting, but then drove it into the ground by using it over and over again and not coming up with anything new. Uh, there were some good parts in that. Uh, I thought that the beginning bit with the marriage was cute, but also brought home the point of why Jim and Muriel got concerned. The hike was great. Uh, there were some good jokes. I love the joke where he said that it was a special uh, type of spruce and one of the kids piped up, it's a spruce with uh, maple leaves on it. So it was fun. I did miss uh, having Gail Gordon in this. And when I look at cast lists for future episodes, at least as recorded by the Radio Gold Index, they don't have him on it. So he may not be in the series anymore, which is a shame, but there wasn't a whole lot for him to do in this particular episode anyway. It was also interesting that Constable Arquette was played by Cliff Arquette, which is something that you hear in the golden age of radio where people will play characters that are at least somewhat named after themselves. Over on our Great Detectives podcast a few weeks back, we played an episode where there was a character played by Eric Snowden who was named Eric Snowden. That sort of thing does not happen nearly as often these days, but there are exceptions. I mean... 
Jerry Seinfeld played a character who was named Jerry Seinfeld on his TV show, so I guess there are variations on that theme. Listener comments and feedback now, and we have a comment from Terrence who writes, Radio Archives is a great source. It has the Cavalcade of America episode of Nancy Hanks, the mother of Abraham Lincoln, and my relative's on my late mother's side of the family, portrayed by Agnes Moorhead. Well, thanks so much for the comment, and that definitely sounds worth checking out. Uh, While I was paused in my recording, my wife came by and noted that while I cited Seinfeld as something that was current, it actually started airing 30 years ago. Now that I'm officially ancient, we'll go ahead and wrap up this episode. Uh, If you do have a comment, email it to me, uh, box13 at greatdetectives.net. But for now, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.